Tonight, I gave the title, it's called The Roller Coaster of History, and actually when we get further into this topic, then you'll understand why I, I chose that topic. But um, the more formal name, um, you can call it The Social Cycle, and another um, subtitle, A New Interpretation of History. So, because that's what we're going to be doing tonight, we're going to look at history and how to understand it, understand it not just for academic reasons, you know, um, because we like to study history, but because we want to know what's happening in the present and what might happen in the future, and also what role we can play to make a better future. So that's why it's, it's important to, to understand how history works. And that's why some people have said that if we don't understand um, history, then we, we might repeat and repeat it and repeat it in a negative way. We don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. So how should we understand history? So um, there have been many, um, we're, we're not the first people to think about this. I mean, this is a, a subject which has um, long been thought about. And so people have, have usually uh, looked at a few factors, you know, when they study history. So some people look at um, great individuals. They say that some Abraham Lincoln came, so that's why um, everything happened. If he hadn't been there, what would have happened? Who knows? Um, so some people say that history is shaped by great individuals. Some people say that it's, it's, we have to look not at the people, but look at the economic forces um, that, that um, are around, and, and then we can understand history. And those people have also, as a corollary or a sub-factor, they look at, um, excuse me, economic forces, but they also look at class struggle. They say that there are haves and there are have-nots, and, and then you can understand history by this struggle um, of the haves and the have-nots. And then um, some mystical or great thinkers or macro thinkers have, have looked to cycles in history. They say that there are, there are great cycles that we should try to understand, repeating cycles even. So um, the social cycle um, has, you know, um, which I'm going to talk about tonight, is from the book Human Society, Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar. And this theory incorporates some of the other factors which people have thought about in the past, but there's something really new that's added to it. And also, if you want to go into the literature, it's Human Society, but part two is the one that talks about history. So this is, this is the source of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So the heart of, the, um, of, of this new understanding is to understand um, class. And history can be understood by studying the rotation of the dominance of four distinct mentalities in various ages. So class is different from what we've thought about it in the past, because usually someone says that, let's say, I make um, $10,000, that means I'm a working class person in America today, that would be, you know, it's low income, and yes, I'd be working class. And then if someone really makes more money, maybe 50000 that person will say, oh, well, I'm in the middle class now. And if that person can get up to um, 100000 then he will say, I'm in the upper middle class. And if he can get to 200000 or 500000 he says, yes, I'm in, I'm in the upper class. Um, and sometimes um, class is viewed as a determination by education. Someone said if he's an uneducated person, that's one class, and then an educated person, another class, and then a super educated person, another class. But here, we're not talking about either um, economic distinction or social distinction, but we're talking about a mentality. So what we're saying here is that in any society, there are four basic mentalities. And um, in any age, one of these mentalities is dominating, and that makes the flavor of the age, the color of the age, and, and there are many kind of institutions that are shaped according to the leading um, class or the, or the mentality which is in the forefront of the society. 
So that's theoretical, but now if we look at history, we can understand how that works. And not only look at history, look at your own family if you want to um, understand um, uh, mentalities. Like for instance, in your own family, you may have some brother, younger brother, who who is um, loves to do all kinds of adventurous things. He will do skydiving, he will do scuba diving, he will do all kinds of daring um, things. He, he likes sports, he likes adventure. It is a type, it's a mental type. There may be, you may have another sister who is very studious and, and she's looking in, in a book all the time and her mind is in, in, engaged in mental things. This is, this is also a type. You may have another cousin or a friend or, or a family member who is really astute with economics and finance and money and, and, and wealth and, and manufacturing or commerce. That's another mentality. You may have another member of the family who's as strong as an ox and, and can, um, goes into, can chop down a tree and goes into all kinds of physical work and it's a, has this kind of a mentality or this kind of a disposition. But we don't have to look at the family, we can look at history, look at human history and we can see how these mental types have worked. In the beginning, we have a type which we call the worker. I alluded to that before, like if you had someone in your family who, who can chop down a tree and, and, and has inexhaustible strength for physical work. So at the dawn of the human evolution, the primitive people were struggling against nature. The, the environment was much more challenging to them as compared to um, a modern human being. And, and because of that, these humans, their minds were dominated by physical forces. So this is actually the first type, mental type. The person who is engaged in the struggle for existence and whose mind is dominated by the, um, the physical forces. So those people who are struggling for existence in any age and whose minds are dominated by matter are known as workers or we can use a Sanskrit term which is called shudras. So this is, this is a type. In any society you're going to, to find this type. But in the very beginning, the dawn of civilization, then this, this was what almost everybody was, was of this nature. One thing about the Sanskrit terms, which I'm, I'm using now, um, these Sanskrit terms are the same terms which in Hindu religion is used as um, the different um, parts of their caste system. So like in the Hindu religion, there's a Shudra caste, and these are generally like the, um, the, the low caste or working people of the society. But here, we're not talking about um, a caste, or we're talking about a mentality. And in fact, within one individual, there could be several of these mentalities. And also, even if someone is predominantly one mentality today, um, that can change in the future. But in the Hindu religious system, it's fixed by your birth. But here, we're not talking about that now. Only the, the name is, is similar. So we're talking about mental types. Another way to describe this, it's another word which I haven't written on the screen, but it's called varna, it means a color. So there's a color. So and that's why I say there's a, each age has its own color. So um, the workers were the first people, the people who were struggling for the shudras, struggling for existence. But um, among these primitive humans, there were some people who stood out because they were brave. Um, instead of cowering uh, before the uh, natural forces, they had a, a fighting spirit to, to um, use their physical might to overcome, uh, overcome nature. So, so this is another distinct um, mentality that, that emerged from amongst the, the, uh, the people who were struggling against nature but who were, were intimidated by nature, who were dominated by nature. So here, another mentality is here, another type. And this type of person felt that with my physical might, I can overcome nature. And because of this um, 
uh, this quality it was a valuable quality um, if you have a group of people and then everybody is um, is afraid and then you have one or two or three people who have this valor um, they become the leaders they, they stand out and and they were leaders and they were and they by their characteristic they were they were militant and forceful that's why we call them the warriors the Sanskrit term for this um, is Katriya. It's Kshatriya or Katriya. So we say in summary, in any age, those people who use their physical might to overcome matter or nature, these are called the warriors or the Katriyas. So we take we look at history now, and we and we say that history from the time of the uh, um, the old Stone Age. Um, until through the period which we call ancient history, this is the age of the warriors. So this is the time of Alexander the Great um, and all the war, the, the, the Mesopotamian um, empires in Babylon, Assyria, the Egyptian Empire. So if you study Western history, this is the story of the ancient times. Um, the, the biblical times is a story of of this where the um, warriors were the dominant class in the society. And what their, um, the form of government was monarchy. Why was monarchy the form of government? Because originally, when the warrior class began, how did they would determine the top warrior would be the one who could win in combat. So that was the, the bravest person, the strongest person, became the leader. But instead of um, having each time when, when um, they wanted to change the leadership, instead of having a new fight to see who was the strongest one, it, it was more socially, um, the social um, stability was better if they can just have a, a way of designating the new leader. So they designated the new leader, usually um, on a hereditary basis, and this would avoid fights amongst the different warriors. So it was already decided that there is a, there's a ruling family and then um, the son will become the next ruler. Um, so, so monarchy was the, um, the system of government which was uh, most um, suitable for this kind of an age. And um, what was the warrior age like? It was age of warfare and conquest where um, empires would expand, uh, warriors would would um, would take their armies across different um, continents, even, and so that that was what the age was all about. And, and the the, um, the leaders uh, of that age, the people who were most respected, were the best fighters. So this is the the ancient history is is the age of the warrior, but. Nothing lasts forever. This is uh, one of the important things we have to remember, that, that things don't last forever. This change comes. And the change comes due to um, the needs, uh, changing needs in the society. So we have a, um, another type in the society um, called the intellectuals. And they evolve due to historical factors as you see on the screen here. The warriors were not able to run societies by themselves. They needed uh, weapons, so they had to, they were not um, inventors of weapons, they were fighters. They had to go to the people who could invent the weapons. And then they had some other limitations. If they conquered territory, they had to know how to administer it. Um, they had to, judicial system is there, taxing system is there, there are so many different factors that happens when you have when you have a village that's one thing but when you have ten villages and then when you have a whole one nation and then emperors were they conquered many nations so this is um, requires some skillful administration so in any society you will find people who their strength comes not from their physical prowess, but from their intellectual capacity. Their capacity is um, they can conquer the world with their mind. And so the people who conquer matter or nature with their mental force 
are called intellectuals or they're called vipras. So what happened was that gradually these intellectuals uh, became sought after by the warriors and they became a dominant um, factor in the society. And um, so then we have the age of the intellectuals. So what is, in Western um, times, we can say the Middle Ages, um, after, the, um, after the age of, of warriors, the middle, the middle Ages came. And what was the Middle Ages like? Um, so, and also another factor, how this happened, there, like I said before, the warriors needed um, other people in order to, for them to rule. But another factor was why they gave up their rule was the, the warrior kings became feeble. Um, monarchy, I stated before, was useful for them because it, it avoided excessive bloodshed whenever you wanted to change the leadership. But the downside of monarchy is that um, the son of the king may not be such a great warrior as, as the king was. There's no guarantee that the king, uh, the new king, is going to be um, really have valor, have the qualities, the qualities which enabled the warriors to become predominant in the society. And so hereditary, uh, hereditary rule brought in unworthy leaders. So this weakened the hold of the, uh, of the warriors. And then um, what happened in the Middle Ages was the intellectuals who usually, I say often, but it was usually in religious roles, they became predominant. And with that predominance, government changed. Um, and religious institutions and dogmas became important, but then the government changed. And, and we have a, a new form of government, which this is a new word which um, coined by um, Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, but it really fittingly describes what happened in the Middle Ages. So it was ministocracy. So kings and monarchs would appear to rule, but the ministers and religious people were the real rulers. They were ruling behind the throne. So you have, um, not only they were behind the throne, but like they were, uh, in the Middle Ages, the, the Pope uh, in Europe would crown the kings, like um, Charlemagne of France was crowned by the Pope. So, so the, this is where the power was. So in the, we have the Middle Ages as a time of, um, of, of the predominance of religious institutions, of dogmas, and the priests, and the ministers. These were, um, were the, the guiding um, forces in the society. But um, change occurs, and even within the um, the uh, the time of the of the intellectuals, there were people who have another mentality, who with their their mind, they 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 try to um, accumulate wealth. Um, so, like I said here, the intellectuals like the warriors before them, could not run society without the help of others, and they needed um, the help of these capitalists, because this is one of the um, interesting um, twists in the story, is that the intellectuals are the ones who can appreciate the rare and expensive goods, like the spices of the, um, of the uh, Orient and the tapestries, but they had to turn to merchants and traders and manufacturers also to get these things. So that's why um, in, um, in Europe you, you see that um, they had to send Marco Polo to, um, to the far reaches of the, of the East to bring back these, these fine um, spices, the fine garments, um, precious metals. Um, but it was only the, these intellectuals who could enjoy this. But that was their downfall in a sense, because in order to get these things, which they so prized, um, they had to turn to some other people to do that. And these were the merchants and the traders. So the people who use their intellect to amass physical wealth are known as capitalists, or we can also call them 
acquisitors, or in Sanskrit they were called Vaishas. And in the, in the Hindu um, caste system, also the merchant class is called Vaishas. But here we're not talking about, um, we're talking about a mentality. It's a mentality that, that I have a mind, and what am I going to do with my mind? I think I'm going to um, try to accumulate wealth. That's, that's my, um, my uh, predisposition. That's what I like to do. That's my habit. So the people who, um, with their mind, were able to, to use it to accumulate wealth, amass wealth, produce wealth, are the capitalists. And, um, and as they became more and more important, um, they, they defined the age. It became an age of, of acquisitors, an age of capitalists, an age of, of wealth. So what was the age of capitalists? There was a commercial and industrial revolution. So the commercial revolution was the, um, when they sent these uh, Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama and all the explorers around the world, and Spain and Portugal sent them. Because why did they send them? Because the, these um, they wanted to have this wealth. They wanted gold. They said they had a philosophy called mercantilism that would bring the, all the gold of the world, we'll put it in Spain, we'll put it in Portugal. That was their philosophy. And um, so the capitalists w were in the forefront of, of this. And not only was there a commercial revolution, there was an industrial revolution because then uh, industry was there, but then if you can apply machines uh, to it, then this was a real revolution instead of one person um, um, refining cotton, then you can have a machine to, um, to do it. And then you can have weaving and giant industries. And that's what happened, especially in England. There was an industrial revolution. So this was really the, the it was no longer the, um, the priests couldn't do this and the warriors couldn't do this. This was, you needed the out and out capitalists to do this. So that's why power passed from the hands of intellectual and religious leaders and into the hands of the wealthy capitalists. And government also changed. This is um, something which people will not think about um, uh, because the, the preferred form of, of government of these capitalists was something new. Um, there was agitation in Europe, especially um, against the kings and, and, and for for democracy, um, and this became the um, form of government. So that the capitalists always pref they prefer um, democracy uh, because if there's a king, then the arbitrary rule of the king could um, could be um, uneconomic. What the king, you know, the king might have a fantasy he wants to do this. Even capitalists generally don't like dictators or. Um, because there's arbitrary rule. They prefer um, a, a democracy because they can actually control a democracy more easily they can, than they can control a monarch or even a dictator. Um, but, you know, and the one thing I want to say, I'll go back here. You know, each age, and I'm going to talk about this more, this is actually very important, each age has its upside and downside. So for instance, if we go back to the, um, the warriors, when the warriors um, um, ruled, they, they brought in security for people. Um, and so the people didn't have to worry about the, the tigers and, uh, and the um, lions and the, or other, other tribes even, um, or other people. Um, preying on, on helpless people, that the warriors would protect them. So this was the, um, the upside of the warrior era. And um, then the warriors reached a plateau, but then they, they started to um, hurt the society by going on needless conquests and um, in engaging in very cruel kind of um, practices. Like, for instance, during the warrior age, when one... Um, kingdom would overcome another kingdom, then all the, the members of the other kingdom, they were forced into slavery, they were taken off their land, uh, so many things happened. Um, so it was, a, it was a terrible time of, of this age of the, um, the warriors. And then when the, um, 
age of intellectuals came, then they brought in uh, new learning and uh, new ideas and everything. So it was a um, it, it was a new light came in the society. But when the intellectuals were um, dominant, then they started to exploit it with religious dogmas and then also religious wars, which are even worse than the, the wars of the uh, of the warrior kings. So, 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 and society reached um, a level of, of despair. And the capitalists too, they helped the society in the beginning because the wealth was increased and, and, so, and new inventions came uh, and there was a new level of civilization. But um, capitalism had its downside and I had and still has so what was the, um, the problem of capitalism? They increased the total wealth of the society, but there were inequalities. So these inequalities, they're felt today. That's what we have in the Wall Street movement. You know, you talk um, in America, we have this um, the slogan, you know, the, we are the 99% because people have realized that, that this really 1% of the society has as much wealth as, as 99%. And even it's, one tenth of one percent has 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 enormous amount of wealth. Even even one family in America, um, the the family that owns Walmart, has, has so much wealth. It's equal to hundreds of thousands of, of people, millions of people. So serious inequalities. And another factor um, in all of these you know, in all of these um, uh, ages. What happens is that you have the top dogs and the bottom dogs. You have the people at the top of the pecking order. You have the people at the bottom, and and the other classes are are exploited. And in the capitalist age, there are, the other classes exist. There are people who are warriors. There are people who are intellectuals. There are people who are workers, but all of them are mercilessly exploited. The work. Workers are exploited. The warriors are, are exploited. You know, a warrior, you know, there's nothing wrong with a warrior or a soldier. A warrior wants to, um, to defend his country. He wants to do something valorous, you know, uh, has high ideals to protect the weak. But in the capitalist age, the warrior is a slave of the, of the, of the, uh, the ruling um, um, government or regime, and the warrior maybe has to to kill women and children. The, war, the warrior is, is told to do things which are against really the code of a warrior. The worker is exploited. The intellectuals are bought by the by the um, by the capitalists, and the intellectuals have to have to tell lies. They have to say, say that even when it's day, they have to say it's night. And everyone is is a wage slave. Everyone becomes a worker. Um, and here we have a similarity with the um, the Marxist interpretation because that's what Karl Marx noted too. He noted also the, the, um, the excesses of capitalism and the inhumane um, aspect of capitalism. And he said that yes, in the final stage of capitalism, you have people who are the haves. And you have the have-nots, and he said the haves are the, um, the owners of the means of production, and all the rest he termed the proletariat or the workers. And then he said, and also this theory also says that when exploitation reaches an extreme point, the masses revolt and they overthrow the capitalists. And this happened, but his theory um, failed to describe what would happen next because. The theory of, of says that there will be a worker revolution and a worker society should come, and then there should be um, the rule of the proletariat. He even said it was called the dictatorship of the proletariat. So that's his name for Shudra is the proletariat. But what we will look at here is we're going to see something different. Um, there's a rotation of the social cycle. And um, the movement of the age of workers to the age of capitalists, ending in the work in a worker revolution, is one full rotation of the social cycle. 
But at the end of the capitalist era, there is no worker age or worker society. Um, the reason for that is that those people who are, are truly uh, of this worker mentality, and I mean the mentality where their mind is more dominated by, by material forces and they're just more thinking for their struggle of existence, they are not capable of, of running a society. And that's why power quickly passes to the warriors. So there were several revolutions uh, where capitalism reached its extreme in, in our recent history. Uh, we talk of the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution or even more recently the Cuban Revolution. So uh, in the, the Cuban Revolution, um, you know, Fidel Castro came and he was wearing his army fatigues even 50 years after. Um, so after the age of the war, and then, so there was, um, so power quickly passed to that warriors and remained with them. After the age of the warriors comes another age of intellectuals and then capitalists. We have also an example of this in, in our um, recent history. Uh, there was the, the Soviet Union existed from 1917 um, to 1991 um, or so, uh, 19, like that. So. And also in Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe even gives a, a better um, example, like we have um, in Czechoslovakia and Poland, Lithuania, there were governments which were um, communist governments in Poland from 1945 on. And what happened? What happened was, we talk about, you've heard of maybe the Velvet Revolution in um, Czechoslovakia. So who, who took over after the, um, after, after the communists left, it was um, Václav Havel. He was a playwright, and in, in um, Lithuania there was a, um, a university professor named is Lenz Burgess. He was the first president. So the, the intellectuals actually overthrew um, the warriors. They or they didn't. It was it was um, because they were intellectuals. It was they didn't use arms. It, it's, it was like that. But then quickly, um, we saw this in Eastern Europe that the intellectual gave way very quickly to capitalists. So this is how the flow of the social cycle goes. And that's why I call it the roller coaster of history. Um, like I said before, there was good and bad in every era. Um, and I'm recapping what I said before. The workers provided protection and humanity was able to conquer the planet. And as monarchies were established, workers exploited and then engaged in useless combat. And intellectuals came, they broadened the society, more learning, then exploited through dogma. And capitalists added wealth that end up oppressing everyone. So this is what we call the roller coaster of history. How it goes like this. So suppose we have the warrior age, look at point A. Now from point A to point B is when the warriors added something, protection to the society, they added value to the society, um, they contributed to the well-being of humanity. But when they started to engage in useless combat and cruel, um, and cruel conquest and, and cruel uh, treatment of all the people, of the rest, other people of the society, then you have the declining phase from B to C. And when they reach the pit, they reach the bottom, um, then they, they lose their strength, then the intellectuals take over. And they also add some, some, some value. And then they reach the zenith point at the top of that hill. And then they start to exploit. And then they, society goes down, down the slope, deep slope of, of ignorance and superstition and, and, and um, religious war, and they reach the bottom point. And then the capitalists take over, and they broaden the society with, um, with wealth and, and, and more new possibilities, and um, life can become more comfortable, at least for some people, anyway. But when they reach their, their zenith point of exploitation, then society suffers, and it, it goes down, 
and finally um, there is a, a revolution and second warrior age comes. So there is no age of the proletariat. Instead of what they call the dictatorship of the proletariat, it was actually the dictatorship over the proletariat and was ruled by the Red Army in, um, in Russia and, and the army in Cuba and the, and the Chinese army in, in China. And um, when we look at change, also we want people want to know, well, how fast will this change come? Um, how long does it take between eras? Well, there's no um, sure answer to this. There are different kinds of change. Um, one form of change um, is called natural change. And this will happen over, um, over time um, due to natural movement. Uh, it could be many years, thousands of years it could be. But then there's evolution when there's the conscious application of force to change the society. And then there's even a quicker way to get change. Revolution, application of tremendous force to change society in a very short period. And sometimes there's change that goes in a backward way through um, counter-evolution, some forces applied and go, goes back, or counter-revolution, and, and tremendous forces applied and society goes back. For instance, in Iran, during the time of the Shah, there was capitalist age, the US government was there and all the American companies, and then um, some religious people came and they, they made a revolution and, and they went back to a theocracy which was more the style of the Middle Ages. But these counter-evolutions and counter-revolutions are short-lived periods. So now the question comes, uh, you've seen the kind of movement we have, and and history goes up and down, up and down. So can we check this flow and can we eliminate exploitation? Uh, can we escape the roller coaster? So the answer, according to the, um, the theory of the social cycle, according to P.R. Sarka, is um, a resounding yes. Um, So there's one more concept in how, how we can avoid the declining phases. And this is the concept of the Sadvipra. Spiritual revolutionaries who work to achieve progressive changes for human elevation on a well-thought, pre-planned basis by adhering to the principles of morality. So the idea here is that if uh, there can be some people who the, which is called Sadvipra. Basically, it means an intellectual who directs his or her mind towards the goodness, towards the, the supreme goodness. This is called a Sadvipra. So these spiritual warrior revolutionaries, they embody uh, the best features of the worker, warrior, the intellectual, and the capitalist. So it means the point here is that these are declassed people. They don't represent any of the, um, the particular uh, denominations. They, 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 they encapsulate the best of all of them, and they work for the good of all. This is the defect of any society, is that the rulers usually work for the interests of themselves or of their own particular um, class, their own particular um, group of people. But if we could have some leaders who don't look for any section but look for the whole society, then um, things can change. So these are declassed. They do not favor the interests of any particular class. And these people, according to Sarkar, they sit at the nucleus of the society and when any particular class enters the period of exploitation, they apply force to move the social cycle forward to a new era. So the, here's what we have to say is that the social cycle will rotate. There's always going to be a different flavor of each age, 
there will be a warrior age, there will be a, uh, an intellectual age, there will be a capitalist age, and it will change, um, but it will not be the same as before. It's not like a circle, you can think of it more of a spiral. And here's a way how to um, look at it in another way. Um, so we've seen before, like, here's on my map, drawing the first hill is the intellectuals, they come up and they go down, and then the capitalists come and they're, they're going up, and now they start to go down. But before they reach the bottom, the sun vapors intervene, and they apply some force, and they bring in the new warrior era. And if that warrior era looks like it's going down, the, the sun vapors intervene again in that second indentation, or the last indentation, you see, and they bring in the new intellectual era. So this is the um, possible direction for the future. So um, when the Sarvipras become established, then um, the society doesn't have to descend into exploitation in each era. So that's why Sarkar said, um, I request rational, spiritual, moral, fighting people to build a Sarvipra society without any further delay. These Sarvipras will have to work for countries, all countries, for all round liberation of all human beings. Let the new human being of the new day wake up to a new sunrise in a new world. So this is the, um, the social cycle and really um, I've just in this um, 45 minutes I've just run through it very quick but it, it's really a rich um, uh, field of inquiry for, especially if you if you like history, uh, and you, you, as I was always fascinated by it, and so you should read the book called *The Human Society*. But read part two, if, read both parts, but especially part two. And then there's another essay called *The Place of the Sadhvipra in the Social Cycle*, Samaj Chakra, in the book uh, *Idea and Ideology*. And there's a new book, um, *Sadhvipra Revolution*, which is a com compilation of articles and quotes. Uh, about Sarvipra is from the works of P.R. Sarkar. So this is um, um, my understanding of the social cycle and uh